Hello, I'm Tom Pryor, and I'm super excited to be joined by multidisciplinary creative, author, ex-drag queen, owner to a dog called Celine Dion, and most recently embarking on a pop music career um, under the guise of Tom Rasmussen. Welcome to Axel Arigato Talk. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. What a pleasure. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm good. Yeah? Yeah. I'm trying to quit smoking, so mm. it's edgy. Through what means? Just trying to quit. So if I, you know, go into an intense mood swing, we'll just have to cut. Oh, you know what I mean? I'd rather leave that in. Yeah, no, quite iconic. Yeah. Okay. Like throw the table over. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, have so much to get into. So let's get into it. Let's get into it. I want to talk about um, Fantasy Island Obsession, mm. which is uh, the first release mm -hmm. with Globetown Records. Mm. Um, when did it come out again? In, it came out in March. Okay. Um, but it was like a, it's been like a long process. I mean, what I really always wanted to do was like be a pop star, mm -hmm. right? And obviously that dream changes over time in that. It evolves. Well, yeah, it evolves and like you, your wants change. And like, and so like, you know, I did, as you mentioned, I did drag for years and that was sort of like a shadow to what I really wanted to do, which is like write my own music and mm -hmm. perform my own music as me. Mm -hmm. So um, you always had the itch and then you eventually scratched yeah, kind of. I mean, we'll see. I, the proposition is different to what I thought I'd ever do. And like, I turned 30 last year and like, I'm glad in a way that I didn't release, write and release music when I was like 19. Cause mm -hmm. I'd have probably written some absolute shit back then. But like now I feel like it has a, it has, it's, it's the first time I've released something and there's a whole album, six, 16 track, I think. Wow. I might cut one. Okay. Um, but there's a whole album due to be released and it's the first, thing I've ever done mm -hmm. where I put it out and I like didn't feel even a bit questioning about it. Mm. Everything I've ever put out, I'm always like, oh shit. I know. Like, oh, this isn't right. Or like, oh, I'd do that totally differently. And I think that is the nature of like, in any way being like an artist, but like, this feels like the clearest proposition. And how did it come about? Because it features uh, Kai Zaya Jamal. Yeah, yeah. Who is um, an incredible person mm. and- um, Poet. Poet, person, yeah. everything in between. Well, Kai and I have been friends for a long time and we, Kai was moving house and I can drive. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I can drive and Kai needed someone with a van. So we hired mm -hmm. a van and I, we drove all around West London picking up furniture from like really posh families that oh. Kai had like found on Facebook Marketplace for like a steal. Mm -hmm. And we were like sort of both talking about, I guess, queerness and transness and proximity to death. We're going there. And um, <laughs> then Kai was like, Kai and I were sort of talking about like what it would feel like to live on, live in a place where there was only people who understood you mm -hmm. basically. And so then I went into the studio and- But at the time uh, it feels like a fantasy. Yeah, it was sort of about fantasizing about escaping violence and escaping being misunderstood and finding a place where you're probably understood. Yeah. yeah. But so, it's an incredible song. Thank you. Yeah. It's very, um, it's got trumpets, which I adore. It does. And yes. it gives me like sort of um, very Ibiza. Yeah, that's not quite what I wanted, but I love that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know those Ibiza tracks that happened back in the day with the trumpet? Oh, love You know, those, yeah, 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 the one yeah. with the saxophone? Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, Mr. Saxo B. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what it was going <laughs> Even though I fuck, that's like the music I am obsessed with, but like, yeah, I wanted it to feel like dance music that felt like it had been alive in a room. Like, right. it's so easy to, for it all to just sound like it's only existed on a computer. I guess I also, I wrote and recorded the album in and in throughout the pandemic. Mm. And so I wanted, I was just looking for li like life, something that felt like it was alive. And also a real escape. Yeah, a real escape. But the album goes over through an arc, which is like, basically it starts off with escapism and then crashes into reality. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's basically about, a violent attack that I've writ written about so many times. Mm. And- That happened to you? Yeah. yeah. One of many, but a really particular one. I, it's really defined part, a big part of my twenties, which in terms of my mental health, in terms of my relationship with going out, clubbing, going on the street, mm. my relationship with what I write, my rela relationship with work, my relationship with my body, like, you know, violence really can define all those things f and it's taken out of your hands. So I really wanted to sort of write a final piece of work about this. And that's what this album is basically. Mm. It's called Bodybuilding. And it's like about 
rage and about escape and about finally accessing, I guess, like meaning and reality. That's like kind of what I wanted it to be about. And so bodybuilding, does that inform the cover art, which is incredible? Well, the, the cover art for the single was shot by Thurston Redding and that is just one thing. And then there's a few more pieces of cover art coming and then Tim Walker actually just shot the cover art of the album. And mm -hmm. it, again, it's like, it's much more, you know, I'd done drag for a decade. So it's much more gender melted. That's gotcha. kind of what I just really wanted it with the imagery. The first thing I thought was I just want, I've been so specific in the imagery I've put out. Mm. I just really wanted people to look at it and like double take and be like, what is that? You know, I've been, I, I, as a non-binary person, I've been so concerned with trying to make my gender like legible to mm -hmm. others, to make people understand that I don't exist as one or the other. But then what you're doing is you're contributing to the creation of like a third legible gender. And that has caused problems for me internally and externally where you know, you're read as a certain thing. And if you're not quite conforming to this legible gender of non-binary, then you're like, you're, are you not non-binary? And so mm. I wanted to just sort of melt everything a bit and like try and figure out some edges. It's really a lot been, uh, been a lot about edges and trying to like go to the edge and I don't know, trying to follow a feeling as opposed to like a, a pre-prescribed thing that I've contributed to creating. Do you know mm, what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. How did you approach the writing for the record? Because you've been a writer for a while and you've dipped your toe in many fab titles and on many interesting subjects, which we'll get onto later. Mm. Um, because it's a conceptual album, mm. how did you approach it? Maybe you could pull out a few tracks or maybe as a whole. Um, what was the writing process like and how did it come to be? Well, it was re it's really self-conscious initially because I'm in another band called Thigh High, which is like really much more like big queer story arcs. And like, that's like so many lyrics and big mm. stories. And we always, when we sit down and write with my writing partner, Hattie Carmen, we always like sit and we're like, who do we want to tell a story about? And it would be like our grandmas or like, it would be like Avril Lavigne's clone or it would be like, oh it's What's really fun. Again? Sorry. What's her name again? Avril Lavigne's um, Melissa. Yeah. And the theory behind that is? That Avril died of Lyme's disease, bless her quite recently and they cloned her with someone called Melissa who's been living life as Avril since. Yeah, a little while ago. And then our story is that Avril actually now lives in a cave and all of the clones like short circuited and then she made, it's it's a very lol, very queer, iconic song. But like with this, it was more self-conscious because I was trying to write something that was about like, it's really weird using yourself as like a vector, I guess, for like the queer voice because mm. like with a book, at least you can write a hundred thousand words. And with an article, you can write a thousand words. So you've got a lot more space to cover a topic. But with this, I was trying to like write about emotion as opposed to like really specified issue mm -hmm. based subjects. And so it was really self-conscious. And so the first few songs that I wrote were like three words only. Mm. And I was really then got fascinated with music that is three or four words only because I think it allows the listener to like imprint themselves onto it. Like, yes, this first song is called Fantasy Island Obsession, and that's the only lyric I sing for three minutes. But at the same time, I guess what I wanted was people to like be able to like constantly reinterpret what fantasy and obsession means mm -hmm. when they listen and imagine their own. Mm. But then as the album goes on, it becomes much more lyrical, um, much more big bangers. There's one really like ragey rock song about tra like transness, but it's never doing that thing that I would do in my prose writing, which is like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna write a piece, which is, useful as well. Like I'm going to write a piece about something to do with being non-binary or like trans rights or, or being queer. It's just like, I'm going to write about what it feels to feel rage. Yeah. And from the voice of a trans person, that's kind of what mm. comes out. So I don't know, it was, it was enriching. I, I feel like I sat with feelings more. I can't wait to hear the rest of it. Thanks. I've known you for, I'm not going to tell our age. Quite here, a but while actually. Quite a minute. Yeah. I think for more than a minute, but I remember the first time I ever laid eyes upon you, it must have been Dawson Superstore or The Glory or some kind of, you know, mm -hmm. institution for East London gays. And I heard these, it must have been a Kate Bush song or it must have been a Kylie number. Probably but was. I heard you before I saw you, basically. Mm -hmm. And I peeked in and I saw you at the end on stage as Crystal Rasmussen, mm -hmm. which was your drag. Bless her. R.I.P. Yeah. Um, and I've never seen anything like it before. Oh. And I think from there it was just onwards and upwards. Mm. Tell me about Crystal, because she was, I mean, what a woman. What a woman. I mean, Crystal, it's actually Crystal. Oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, Crystal. she's not here to tell you off, but like, um, I mean, she was the best thing that ever happened to me. I like, mm. you know, I studied, I was training to be like 
a vet at university. And then I met people who were drag queens and was like, fuck, this is what I am. She became an expression of loads of things that I needed, like a, like a, I don't know, like a totem, I guess. Mm -hmm. And like, so I grew up without, with not much money. And so like she was rich and I grew up having not really left my hometown and she was so international and yeah. I knew nothing about history. And then I was at, found myself at Cambridge and people would be like, oh yeah, the Cold War. And I'd be like, oh, what the fuck is that? So my whole response to that was like, Crystal would be like, yeah, I was there. You know, it was very like a, a way to insert myself into often situations that made me feel, I guess, if I'm being completely honest, mm. really working class because a Cambridge class is so tense and fraught. And so in a way that's where she was born. And then when I got to London, she was about expressing gender and she was about express expressing freedom. And so as the years went on, I did it for a decade with her. As the years went on, she kind of fed me all the things I needed. And then I found that I wasn't giving her anything. Mm. So that's kind of why I killed her, I guess, in the end. How did you kill her? I just did a massive show where I crowd surfed and, and sung and cried and drunk three bottles of champagne on stage. Nice. It was really chic. I think it's what she would have wanted. Yeah, it is. I was going to do like a proper funeral and stuff. Like the Divine David, like I think, if I'm not wrong, I think they sliced their neck with a ice skate. Mm. So iconic. Mm. But Crystal's always been quite lazy. She's not really violent. And so she's pacifist, um, ex-revolutionary pacifist mm. now. Um, and so in a way, I just wanted to sing. And I it was nice because I just got to sing all the songs I wanted to sing, that I, but I've never really been able to. Because like, you know, so I sung my favorite song ever, Song of Solomon by Kate Bush. And mm. then I cried, which is so trash, but. I mean, it's so, an emotional moment though. Yeah, and I think it's thrilling. I think we, we're we often like, pushed into us or we push ourselves into a singular lane and it was really exciting to free up a whole space and I've been really bitter for like a year about drag where it's going and stuff and mm. and that's not my place to be I don't own drag it's not my place to be angry or bitter and so I was just like you know what I'm not going to sit here in cafes with my friends and be like you know talking about drag I think drag is one of the most incredible mediums there is and like the talent and skill and I think it's so often underestimated drag. I think it's so often seen as like frippery and seen as like simply humor. And actually it's so much more than that. And it teaches viewers so much more than that. It's a shame it's not given more sort of cultural clout. I think it's still seen often as quite lowbrow and it's really not, it's transformative. I feel like it's quite mainstream though. I, from my perspective anyway, uh, you have to search for really good drag nowadays because it's mm. got into the water supply. Mm, I know what you mean. And, um, you know, I think it's each to their own. I think everybody should try it if the mood takes them and they can have an incredible life doing it. But, you know, with things like RuPaul Drags Race and, and the commercialization of it, um, you really do have to search out good drag. Mm. Yeah, but I, yeah, I agree. And that's where my bitterness sort of sat for a few years. But I think in truth... Which in a way, sorry, no, no, takes please. it back to, um, you know, when it was less commercial. I think we've kind of, it's quite cyclical. We had the rise of it where you had to go to places like in East London, you had to search it out. And then with it being on TV and so readily available, um, now I feel like it's kind of gone back to that day where you have to search it out. Mm. Which is exciting, I guess. I think, yeah. I think the, most, the most potential lies in the King community. I think I see yeah. things that I've never seen before. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, I agree. It's really hard to intellectually navigate the idea of visibility or the idea of like mm. the, the mainstreaming of something that was once so underground and once so, I guess, ultimately oppressed because mm. what you're calling for on those stages when I was young was to be seen. And then when it happens, you, no matter who you are, you're always gonna be seen in the wrong way because in the end, it's like a, in the end, things are about finance and you know, I grew up in the millennial age of sort of selling your personal story for like profile and for what you think is going to be visibility. But in the end, it's, it's, it's why I find it really hard to watch queer TV shows because they're all over Twitter and all over whatever reviews are written. And it's like, this is me and this is representation. And then you watch and you're like, well, it's not because it, you can't be fully represented. So I just feel a lot of disappointment, which is why I just literally you know, watch The Hunger Games over and over again. Like, which you did last night. Which I did literally last night. Not The Hunger Games, <laughs> but it's about class revolution, which is like the aim. So yeah, anyway, like specific. Let's talk about love. Yeah. Love. You released a book called First Comes Love. Yeah. Which, um, tell me about it. It was sort of diving into the concept of marriage and love yeah. as a whole. Yeah. What led you there? 
it was ultimately about this idea of like moral purity, which is like something again that was really, really sort of like really, really grew the idea of grew mm. in the millennial age. It's this idea of like your intellectual your intellectual thought matching your emotional feeling all the time. Mm. And you sort of train yourself. And in some ways it's really important that that is the case. But with something like marriage, I turned 28. All my friends from home were getting married because like in Lancaster, sort of, I guess, marriage skews a bit younger. Mm. And some friends from here were getting married. And it's something I'd always wanted growing up. I grew up, you know, essentially at a Catholic school where marriage was like the absolute pinnacle. And in a, in a working class community where marriage was also seen as a really useful organizing principle, I guess. And so I would emotionally always believed in it. But then when I got to London and then when I met my partner and he was really rad and anti-marriage, I was quite like, oh yeah, intellectually, I believe it's like a misogynist, outdated. But up until thing. that point, you were ready to put a ring on it. Oh my God, I was engaged at 20. Were you? Yeah. That sort of crash and burn. And then I like sort of asked loads of questions about that. And then, so this book came out of this place, not just about marriage. Mm. It's about what do I do when my feeling and my head say different things. And I think I, trying to learn how to make a decision, trying to learn how to proceed to make a big decision or a small decision. Like I've run out of shampoo. I really need it tomorrow. Mm. But uh, do I want to line Jeff Bezos' pockets? Like, right. do you know what I mean? There are these like, and, and people, um, and sometimes we do make mistakes or sometimes mm. we do the thing that's wrong. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and, and so, with this, I wanted to explore that space of like, how how do you proceed when you don't know which part of you to listen to? Can you marry them? Should you have to marry, like marry the head and the heart all mm -hmm. the time? And I also was in a place where I'd really been very jaded throughout my twenties about writing about love. I didn't think it was very cool. Mm. And I think love is like really cool. And now you're leaning into it more? Not just leaning into it. I think I'm admitting what I always knew, which yeah. is like, I grew up obsessed with Carrie Bradshaw, like for all her problems. Like, uh, I think it's really, I think it's really unchic to not be interested in love. I think it's like, I think, yeah, be interested in everything else, but love is like so remarkable. And it's really, uh, people think it's like really saccharine and really like, oh God, mm. but it's like an incredible state. Like, yeah. It's like the best emotion and it contains so many emotions. I think it's like, so I really wanted to write about love. And um, your stance on marriage now, where does that stand? It's exactly the same, which is I don't believe in the institution, but I feel, I feel like I want it. Yeah. And I mean, I'm getting married in July. But I think what I, what, what I interviewed hundreds of people, mm. hundreds of hours worth of interviews about people who access marriage in different ways or in really traditional ways. And was the one that stood out to you? Where like where you'd gone into the interview not at, knowing what to expect and then it completely blew your mind with their viewpoint. Yeah, there was one woman who married a ghost. <laughs> and I think I'd gone in thinking it was gonna be like iconic, memeable vibes. Right. But what she then ended up talking about was really, really intense and moving and like how she was she sort of grew up in a very, very Catholic, very, very Catholic situation and she was a turning 40 and she hadn't found her partner and everyone around her had found her husband and she was like she looking back on it was like the social pressure in a small catholic community to conform and be married and have a plus one meant that i kind of fabricated a ghost and i married a ghost and actually people found that more acceptable than me being single and i was like the culture that is created. And you know, there's all these statistics about marriage is changing, love is changing, but really for most people, even if the stats say different, marriage mm. is still this big, huge pressure. And so that really blew my mind. Cause I was like, thinking it was just gonna be like, you married a ghost bitch, iconic. And like, you know, tell me about him. But she was like really, really bound <laughs> by invested. social pressure. Yeah, uh, I don't know. But what I cho what I realized in the end was that I don't have to do the right thing all the time. I can get married because I'm really in love. Mm. And because we have, I think we have an unusual enough relationship to withstand the normativity of marriage. And so in a sense, yeah, that's kind of. God, what was the ghost called? Captain Jack Sparrow. No. Yeah. She was a fucking legend. She's <laughs> honestly like, she's a, bless her heart. She's amazing. And she was so smart and like, you know, again, it's that thing, the internet had made her into a bit of a meme. Sure. Was she the one that went on this morning? Yeah. Okay, I remember that And now. when I spoke to her, she was so co clever and so aware. But you it's know. until you meet them and actually yeah. hear it from their mouth. Yeah. God, that's insane. Um, something you do on your Instagram, which I tune into, it's weekly, right? It's whenever I feel like okay, it. Okay, it's a bit Sometimes ad hoc. twice a week, sometimes once a month. We yeah, love that. Whatever. No schedule, schedule. 
It's called Chic or Not Chic. Mm, and it's yeah. something that I adore. And um, it kind of sets me up for the week, I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about Chic or Not Chic, because I've got some to ask you. Well, first of all, it's weird because like, you can do a lot in your career, like write books, put on really good shows. Yeah. I hope really good shows. Mm -hmm. um, but like you'll do an Instagram story series and people be like, it's the best thing you've ever done, yeah. which I love because it really is. Yeah. Um, chic or Not Chic is like a stupid arbitrary thing, which went along with like, I want to just be a bit more messy on the internet. Mm -hmm. And basically people submit questions and then I just say if they're chic or not, basically. And weirdly people go wild for it. Like I'm one of them. Me too, actually. Guilty. But I'm more wild for like the things that people ask and like, the, some of the DMs I get, like when I said that Twilight wasn't chic, but maybe it's punk, that's what I said. Okay. I got, I lost like, not that I give a shit, but like, I got like a drove of unfollowings and like some <gasps> really intense abuse. And I, with being a writer, like okay. I once wrote a piece of American Vogue about how cheating's not that bad. Mm. And I still to this day get- Receive hate for it. From like right-wing Christians in America, it's <sighs> amazing. There's this woman on Twitter who messages me and I can't but look because I'm obsessed. Mm, yeah. On her profile, she's like blonde, like mother of four, proud of her boys, little league Volvo mom. She's like very Christian, loves it. In my DMs, she sends me pictures of her perfectly manicured nails holding a kitchen knife. No. Being like, I'm going to slice you open. No. I'm obsessed. Because I mean, of the American Vogue article or because of? The American Vogue article. About cheating. About cheating. Do you She's think like, you don't believe in family values. I've read your stuff. You're like a, oh. you're like responsible for like the failing. I mean, it's really dark. And like, if I didn't have more love in my life or like, or didn't have more structural support, maybe it would affect me, but I am So obsessed. she sends you kitchen knife photos, but in her bio, it's like a Bible verse. In her bio, it's like, be kind. Oh it's my so God, choose love. Ch honestly, uh, choose, choose heterosexual love. But like, I'm like, yes, queen. Like, no. Slay. Okay. She's like threatened to kill me like weekly for about six Do you ever reply? Months. You just leave it I be? I replied once. And what did you say? Slay. 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 And she said, was it just another knife photo? Just she didn't reply. And then like a week later, she'd be like, thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's really camp. It's like desperate housewives shit. Like, I should get her on the podcast. You really should actually. I'll, and then I'll, we can do a Jerry Springer moment where I'm like, <laughs> yeah, she, Here actually, he is. she comes out. I'd yeah, be yeah. absolutely obsessed with that. I'll do it. Okay, I'll, I'll risk know. death for that for that moment. Okay, right. Chic or not chic? I have some I really want to ask you. Okay, silent discos. Not chic at all. Why? It's just embarrassing. Yeah, the, the whole point of dancing is like, it's collective silence is important. Like, yeah. I think being in your own emotions on the dance on the dance floor is amazing. But like, silent discos, trash. I see them around Soho sometimes. Yeah, trash. Yeah. Although sometimes like weirdly like a mom doing a silent disco like in Soho and getting her life like I'm quite like singling out you as chic, but sure. like the act as a whole, dreadful. Okay, noted, noted. Hangovers. Chic. Chic, right? Yeah. You can't be a Mackie's breakfast in bed. No, chic. Bit of Real Housewives and back to bed. Yeah. Also, I love someone who's really active on a hangover. I'm always like... Oh no. No, I'm always quite like they're up and out, quite chic. <sighs> What, when they go running on the hangover? No, not running. No, exercise isn't chic. Sorry. Sometimes when I'm on a, you know, if, if it's gone through to the morning and I'm on the way home and a runner goes past me, physically ill. Yeah, same. But yeah. I'm also quite like, ah, oh, slay me. Slay mama. Splitting the bill on the first date. Not chic. Oh. No. I know I should probably say it's chic because like, you know, from like a feminist perspective where like we should all <laughs> pay for equally. But like, fuck that. No, I want to be paid for. I, or I want to pay. Like, okay. I think it's but all, more like for nicotiness with money. Even though sometimes it's important, definitely. Mm. Like when I go out for dinner, my friends will split to the letter because yeah. like we're all in different states of financial barrenness. And if someone's not drinking and they if get whacked with drinking, the wine, yeah, part and of the that's wine it, it's bill, important it's important because it can feel really disempowering. Yeah, like, for sure. But on a date, yeah, the thing about chic or not chic is it's about instinct. It's not about what's right. Like right, okay. it's right to split the bill, but like it's not chic. I pay hear for you. me or I'll pay for you. Like that's chic. Be mm. cat. On a first date, you've got to be cash about, even if you have not and you're freaking out, See, you've I got to be quite casual about money. You've but I get like, because get I want to know exactly what I'm eating. So I go into a date knowing that I'm willing to pay because I will have the calamari and I will have the big pasta. Calamari is not chic. Even calamari fritti with garlic sauce, aioli? No, it's over. Oh shit, okay. It's been mainstreamed. <sighs> Noted. Um, Glastonbury. I think Glastonbury is quite chic. I think so. And it's the 50th anniversary this year, why not? Yeah, I think it's quite sh I think it's quite chic. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, three more. Halloumi. Um, not that chic, no. Not that chic? It was chic, but it's just been sort of like, 
you know, watered down into like, there's an amazing restaurant called Oklava and the halloumi there is amazing. Oklava. Oklava in Shoreditch. And a friend of mine is from Greece, so we go and visit mm. every year. And like there, if you're having like halloumi, it's like amazing. But like supermarket halloumi shoved into like a, a saggy baguette. No, not, not for me, not for me. Um, podcasts? No, not that cheap. Not that Sorry. cheap? Okay, well, we'll try. No, not that cheap. Again, too popularized. Yeah, I, I mean, that's everybody... literally what we're doing. It is what we're doing right but, now. This is like uh, the Truman Show right now. Yeah, this is a crucial thing. Yeah. About, this is a crucial thing about chic or not chic that people forget. Something being chic, some, sorry, something being not chic doesn't mean that it's not good in any other way. Oh, yeah. Right? But yeah. people are always like, how dare you? And I'm like, hang on. Just because I said, like, you know, pegging isn't chic doesn't mean it's not pleasurable, doesn't mean it's not iconic, doesn't mean it's not funny. It's just it's not just, chic. It's not chic. Yeah. Often chic or not chic is to do with relationship to the mainstream, like champagne sauces. Mm. I remember when I first drank out of a champagne sauce, I was like, this is the chicest thing ever. And then, That's now they're by. Yeah, and you see certain people posting on Instagram, you're quite like, oh no, killed it. Okay, yeah. last chic or not chic, Axel Arigato. You know, before this, I would have said, unsure, like sneakers, not my world. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, but today I'm wearing a sneaker. And I'm loving it. What a sneaker. What a sneaker. Does this feel chic? Feels chic. So I'm going to go with chic. Okay. Not that I would have said unchic. I would have been like unknown, rare neutral. Mm. But like, now I'm wearing. Um, you don't chic. wear sneakers often, you say. It's been a decade since I wore a sneaker. <gasps> well, I'm so glad. And I'm like seriously loving it. Okay. Well, we've popped your sneaker um, decade yeah. long cherry today. Yeah, I feel like sort of a, like, I don't know, like a graphic designer, a gay one that like people want to fuck. You Oof. know? Okay, get in touch. Get in touch. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit it's down with you. So Thank you for your time. And um, I can't wait to hear the new music. Thanks. What a joy. <laughs>